So developing right now, a mystery in Melbourne. Crews are trying to find out what led to a big fish kill. The water in the river Yamuna is frothing with rancid foam. Water contamination continues for thousands of military residents on Oahu. Tonight over a potentially large fish die-off. New at 5 o'clock, we're trying to find out how thousands of fish were killed in a creek. This evening amid this emergency still unfolding off the coast. But the Yixi River is one of the largest. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of fish are dead on the shores of a local lake. We begin with breaking news out of Southern California. These rivers are filled with the chemical the group group say can we see during sanitation and save drinking water? The river theme. New threat tonight. Is being called a potential ecological disaster. I always thought that the, the natural world was something of interest. I enjoyed biology. But, I mean, I took a class when I was in college that I wish I had in high school, which was kind of the drive for me to create the environmental science classes here at Saline, because it would have helped me kind of find a path earlier to see how we can try to live sustainably on, on Earth. Yeah, it was a few years ago, we went to um, a Chautauqua on Lake Erie called Lakeside. Um, and this was sort of at the height of the algal blooms in Lake Erie that comes from the runoff from farms. The water looked like Mountain Dew. It was so green. So I was kind of curious and probably was a, not a smart idea, but I decided to go swimming. And every time you go underwater, it, you couldn't see a thing. So then I thought maybe I should probably get out. But it was the first time I had seen, I had heard about the algal blooms down in um, the Gulf of Mexico, but this was my first first kind of um, seeing up close and, and personal how dramatic it is. It was literally, as far as you could see, just lime green from all the algae. Typically it's the runoff from agricultural operations, so either the manure from animals from farms that, that grow livestock or nitrogen and phosphorus that we put on primarily corn around here or soy or wheat and unfortunately and even the far, for the farmers it's the once it rains it so oftentimes pushes that into smaller bodies of water and eventually they make their way to Lake Erie or you know um, even we see a little bit in the rivers but more the, the lakes themselves is where we see that uh, change in um, the nutrient levels which allow algae to grow. So the really nice lakes that people enjoy, the water doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it, so algae can't grow. All the growth comes from the bottom. Once you start to add those nutrients, we start to see that change. Yeah, I think it is. I know, I know there is some sources of industrial pollutants, but that's much easier to identify. We talked about those a point source pollution. This is much harder, and you're right. We have so much uh, productive farmland, which is great. Um, it's not the farmer's fault this happens. It's just trying to figure out ways, whether it's um, micro fertilizing. So I know in some cases you can use GPS to figure out you don't have to put it over your whole field, but just the sections that are depleted in those nutrients, that may be a, a way to kind of reduce the amount of runoff. Um, but it seems to be one of those source, it's hard to sort of pinpoint exactly where it's coming. Non-point source pollution is one where it's sort of like runoff from um, the parking lots here that end up in the retention pond. Um, if you have a car that's leaking oil or antifreeze, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where that is versus uh, your classic uh, pipe that's piped into the Saline River that's coming from you know, the industrial park or flat out or American soy, you can follow that pipe back to its source and it's much easier to regulate. And so that's why a lot of you know, chemical and industrial businesses are heavily regulated and fall under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act in terms of they're allowed to pollute, but there are limits to what they can do. The society that we live in here, particularly not just Saline, but in the United States, we have a, a relatively industrialized society that's provided you know, well, longer life expectancies and a quality of life that most of us are used to, but that comes with the cost of having polluted waters in some cases. Um, we're lucky that it doesn't seem to be 
uh, to the levels around here that we see in other places, the Hudson River in New York or um, out in Seattle. They've had some issues with sort of legacy pollution that's just, it's sort of impossible to get rid of. Um, and so we see some of that to some degree. Uh, you know, the Detroit River, I know there was a long time where there was a program through the University of Michigan where a lot of uh, people would fish the Detroit River for sustenance. They would feed themselves this way. And what they would actually do is take the fish they would catch and replace it with another type of fish because the levels of bioaccumulation in the fatty parts of the fish were just very, very high. Things like lead, arsenic, cadmium, and those heavy metals sort of have a had an impact on the brain and so they were saying you can certainly fish and we'll replace them for free but trying to keep those populations healthy so we've known about it for a while it's just a hard thing to clean up by and large i mean most of us turn on the tap and the water comes out and we haven't had any real outbreaks so that sort of is a testament to um, the conditions here um, and you know recreating around here you know people still like to go and fish on the Saline river and haven't really reported a whole lot of differences so from my limited experience, it seems as if things are in pretty good shape.